Yeah, good morning, everyone. Good morning from Brussels. I'm Rina Kustova, research fellow from Center for European Policy Studies, and I'm leading SEPs activities on the external dimension of the Green Deal. And today's meeting is part of SEPs work on this topic, and Japan is one of our priorities for work. We have regular series of events on discussing green growth and effective solutions for decarbonization between the European Union and the Japan. And I wish all of you a fruitful discussion today, and I'm happy to pass the floor to my colleague, Milan Elkerbaut, research fellow at SAPS, who will moderate today's event. Milan, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Irina. So uh, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you all uh, to today's webinar. And uh, we will be having uh, a fantastic discussion, hopefully, uh, starting uh, with uh, a in-depth presentation by Professor Komiyama, uh, and I will introduce him uh, in a minute, as well as uh, yeah, the panelists we have, uh, with which we'll be discussing uh, later today. So Professor Hiroshi Komiyama is uh, the chairman uh, of the Mitsubishi Research Institute, and also the chairman of the Platinum Society Network. And indeed, the Platinum Society uh, will be a concept today uh, that will uh, be at the center of uh, Professor Komiyama's uh, presentation. We will hear much more about it indeed. Um, earlier on uh, throughout his career, uh, Professor Komiyama has had an extensive academic experience uh, at the University of uh, Tokyo uh, in various uh, technical uh, departments. Um, in particular, also uh, the Society uh, for Chemical Engineering. So we can really see how the link to industrial decommunization uh, might arise here. Um, then after Professor Kumiyama's presentation, we will uh, have reactions first by uh, Anna de Gilles. Uh, she's a senior research fellow in Nord Regio, uh, which is a research center for regional planning, uh, also part of uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers. And then afterwards, uh, we will also hear from Jörn Döling. Uh, he is at the European Commission at DJ ECFIN, uh, to Economic uh, Affairs and Financial Affairs, uh, whereas he is a head of unit um, for economic situation forecasts and business and consumer surveys unit. Now to start, uh, I would like to uh, give the floor to Professor Komiyama, and um, he will be taking us through this presentation also on yeah, the topic of uh, decarbonization and the Platinum Society. So please, over to you, Professor. Um, the floor is yours. Okay. Should I talk now? Yes, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Miran, uh, for very uh, kind uh, introduction of myself. I will talk about the decarbonization. Uh, can I do it myself? Or please, next slide. Okay, thank you. Uh, today's talk uh, will three points. Uh, I think the now we are living at a turning point in human history. And the key word is saturation, I think. And the secondary, I will talk about the decarbonization by energy efficiency improvement and electrification and renewable energy, the potential and recycling oriented society. And I believe uh, structuring existing knowledge uh, makes us possible decarbonization. Uh, of course, improvement of the technology uh, makes it easier, but even the existing technology we can do. Uh, a turning point in human history, uh, I mean, it's a one is finite earth, uh, some calls it uh, Anthropocene. Uh, and secondary, the 
a long-lived human race. Uh, at uh, the start of uh, 20th century, in 1900, the average uh, lifetime of uh, the world, of the people, is only 31 years old. But now it's exceeded to 73. Uh, this is a huge impact. Uh, and another is the uh, ex exclusive increase of our knowledge. Uh, even the wisest person cannot uh, take the whole of our knowledge. But if we uh, mobilize the right knowledge uh, to right place, we can uh, solve almost all. And this shows a uh, thousand years uh, and uh, due to the industrial uh, revolution, uh, we, the uh, human uh, beings uh, become uh, much richer. Uh, the GDP per capita uh, in the world uh, increased five times in the 20th century. And the, due to the uh, richness, uh, we can live longer, as I said before. And finally, we started to change uh, the atmospheric uh, concentration of CO2. And uh, also, uh, we, the many things uh, of the earth. And uh, because the change of uh, this uh, increase was very rapid, it took only one century. Some of the countries, maybe uh, close to half of the population, cannot catch up with uh, this uh, growth. And uh, so, SDGs, uh, quick, uh, quick please. Yeah, SDGs is how to uh, improve the uh, remaining uh, half uh, to the uh, level of uh, the people's life, life in uh, industrialized countries. But we need to cope with the small birth rate uh, very soon. Uh, 1960s, the average uh, fertility was uh, five uh, in the world, but now it's only 2.4. Uh, soon, in, in the latter, latter, ha latter half of 21st century, the population will peak and start to decrease. Japan has already that experience and China may have so. And so we need to have a vision of the next society. That is platinum society, I define. Uh, next slide, please. Next, please. Okay. Due to the very rapid growth of human uh, civilization, what happened is saturation. This shows a car ownership. Uh, when a uh, 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 state is uh, reached that one car is possessed by two persons, the number of cars uh, is saturated. This is not hypothesis, but it's reality in the developed countries. In Japan, USA, UK, France, Germany, almost all countries one car is possessed by two persons. And that is the saturation point. The next, please. This saturation of artifacts makes saturation of materials. This uh, red line uh, shows the total accumulation of iron in Japan. 60 years ago, uh, almost no uh, iron uh, 
there are few uh, cars and buildings uh, in Japan 60 years ago. But during the era of high growth rate of economy, uh, accumulation started. And now it's saturated. The saturation is 10 tons per person, 10 tons of steel per person. And China uh, will become the same 10 tons per person situation soon, 20, 25, very soon. And world will become saturated uh, around 2050. In that sense, 2050 is a very big shift age of human civilization. What will occur? Next slide, please. In that uh, situation, in industrialized countries, what people want to have now? It's a society in which the earth is sustainable, prosperous, and enables the people with self-realization. I defined uh, a platinum society as this. And decarbonization and prevention of global warming are necessary conditions for a platinum society. Uh, next, please. Uh, in Japan, uh, declared uh, net zero uh, at 2050 last year. Uh, we are a little behind the trend to the carbon neutrality. It's a ridiculous uh, thing in Japan. The, it's cheaper to buy an electric car than a battery. We don't use EV. We, we use EV as a battery. It's cheaper, about half. This means the electric car is a, a global competition uh, merchandises. Uh, but a battery in Japan is protected. Uh, from the outside. But the, if we behave cleverly, we can decarbonize and stop global warming, I believe. And achieved in 2050, then moving towards carbon negative, which is the requirement of 1.5 degree. Uh, and great, this is a great opportunity for Japan because recycling of steels and other metals and uh, renewable energies makes us self-sufficient in natural resources. We now import uh, all of them. Uh, then the what is the CO2 emission? This is a holistic picture of CO2 emission. Uh, it's simple. Uh, we uh, use fossil resource as energy and materials, coal, petroleum, and natural gas. And by the human activity, we make this CO2 to emit ecosystem. Then what are the human activities to consume the fossil resource. Uh, quick, please. This is the uh, consumption of uh, fossil uh, resource. Uh, 37 per this is the case of Japan. 37% uh, making things uh, in factories and houses, offices, and transportations. Uh, this is uh, Electricity power companies are not uh, shown uh, in this figure because the uh, houses use electricity. The electricity uh, uh, CO2 emission is uh, assigned to houses or offices and transportation. So it's not explicitly appear. And so what we need is a brief uh, creek. Okay, uh, this CO2 is. Oh, okay, next, please. 
you know, what must be considered is first uh, transportation, business, and homes. Energy consumption will soon become almost electric. Of course, some heat is needed, but biomass can be used to make heat. And what about industrial emissions, metal production, and uh, chemicals production, in particular plastics, are two major industrial emissions. What should we do? I will talk later. Uh, and third is, is it possible to supply enough renewable, re renewable elect electricity uh, in Japan? This is uh, important. Of course, solar, wind, hydro, biomass, and geothermal. Uh, these five are major source of renewable uh, energy. And uh, finally, fourth is, what is the cost of renewable electricity? I will uh, talk one by one. This is the energy consumption and GDP of Japan. Uh, red is uh, uh, energy, normalized. Uh, to the year uh, 1973, when first oil crisis happened. And look at this, energy consumption decreases 1.5% a year, even though the GDP increases 1% per year. Uh, now, the, uh, at 1973, uh, Japan's uh, GDP was 2 billion uh, US dollars. Now, 5 billion, 2.5 times. But energy consumption increased only 20%. It, GDP increases, energy decreases. Why this occurs? It's saturation and efficiency improvement. When buildings are replaced, new buildings consume usually only 50% energy. And it's much more comfortable to us. Cars are also. Uh, about 10 years, uh, new cars replaces, replace uh, all the car. Then the energy consumption, gasoline consumption becomes half. And that is the reason combined saturation and efficiency with increasing GDP, energy consumption decreases. This is hope. Next slide, please. This is the cost of power sources. Uh, 10 years ago, uh, solar uh, was uh, most costly. By far, uh, and wind uh, mirrors are uh, second uh, costly, and nuclear uh, coal and gas combined cycle. But now, this is the world uh, uh, average uh, cost. Uh, solar and wind are almost the same, the cheapest. And uh, nuclear is most costly. When new power plants were built, so, 2019, 70% of newly built power plants were for renewable energies. This, is, this reflects the cost price of the uh, economy. So, renewables uh, are already uh, 
competitive. Next, right? But how about the potential for these renewable energies? Japan is a highly dense uh, country. But uh, it depends on area. Uh, Tokyo area uh, is high uh, potential. Uh, but half of the potentials were uh, roofs of uh, houses and buildings. And in a local area like Hokkaido, uh, mostly uh, flat land uh, used for uh, fields. And up to 2050, the potential for PV in Japan is 1,000 terawatt hour. This is uh, just uh, the amount now Japan is producing, same amount. So even only by PV, we can supply the present electricity supply. Next, next please. And also we have much uh, potential for, uh, I don't show uh, here, but the uh, much uh, wind, wind power and hydropower and geothermal. Uh, Japan is the third biggest country of geothermal potential and biomass. And Japan declared at 2030, a 46% CO2 reduction and 2050 net zero. Uh, I assumed 70% CO2 reduction in power generation. Then, uh, for example, LNG uh, 383, hydropower 130, solar is biggest 464, wind power 100, and the total is 1,099 terawatt. And what is the 99 bigger than electricity demand? This is thrown away. That's more economical than to have more storage battery. And you can see the cost of power generation, the lowest line. This is quite same as the present Japanese cost of power generation. And even 100% at 2050, not so big increase of power generation cost. But it depends on the demand. If demand increases about double the present consumption, the final uh, uh, role, it, it uh, becomes a little costly, but not impossible. So carbon decarbonization does not increase electricity costs. This is our present uh, conclusion. Next, please. Next, I'll talk about industry. Uh, as I said, metals production and petrochemical petrochemistry are the two biggest uh, challenge. And uh, recycling uh, is now made like the upper line, the, the met metals, uh, including um, uh, aluminum. Uh, aluminum is used as alloys usually, some uh, additives, and they are mixed uh, uh, to make uh, mix metal. Then uh, we cannot make uh, high quality uh, product, low, only low function product like, uh, like this. But now uh, one company in Japan succeeded in producing the uh, Bullet trains uh, 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 parts from the 
bullet trains scrap. This is a very difficult process, but they succeeded. They divided, separated, depending on uh, composition of aluminum alloys. Then they succeeded in producing very high quality bullet trains parts. This is the hope. Next slide, please. 2050, metals will become all horizontal recycling. Uh, we can use uh, DX, uh, digital transformation, using some uh, blockchain technology to trace uh, the materials, and we can recycle to make a new car from old car or a new built train from old built train. This makes energy consumption by far the smallest because uh, usual metal resources are oxides because in the uh, atmosphere contains oxygen, uh, like iron oxide or aluminum oxide. Uh, refining it to remove oxygen, uh, that costs uh, energy. But in the case of uh, recycling, scraps, just melting, which, is, uh, which needs bigger energy, uh, oxygen removal or melting. Oxygen removal consumes much more energy. Uh, theoretically, in the case of iron, 27 times. And in the case of aluminum, 83 times. So recycling like this makes energy consumption becomes very small. This is our hope. Next, next please. So metals are okay. Next, uh, it's electrified and uh, energy saving. And the next is petrochemistry. We believe it must be shifted to biomass chemistry. Uh, this kind of process is uh, extensively developed uh, right away. Uh, this case uh, is one of the case study, the waste plastic um, and biomass is uh, mixed and to supply to the reactor of supercritical water solution. Then it makes NASA-like product. Na so the downstream, downstream from the NASA cracking to make petrochemistry can be replaced by biomass chemistry. But in this case, we must make big quantity of biomass. I, we think the biomass source is a forestry. Uh, but Japan's uh, forestry is very poor now. But we must develop it. But our land is 70% uh, covered by wood. So it's a big opportunity uh, of Japan. Uh, next slide, please. Forests, uh, a big biomass resource. Uh, of course, the, yeah, Europe is uh, much uh, doing much better uh, forestry, uh, like uh, Switzerland, uh, Sweden, uh, Austria, uh, Germany, and so on. Uh, we will do the same and the better one, me mechanization, large scale, and uh, AI uh, supported. Then the 100 million tons of biomass per year can be possible. It is enough to supply the timbers 
the wooden houses as well as biomass industry. And uh, of course, the uh, CO2 fixation becomes bigger. We established a startup business in 2018 and uh, struggling. Now, next, please. Uh, it's not an easy task, uh, but efficient forestry and wooden uh, city and biomass to materials and energy. This is our idea. We started at Aizu. It's uh, located in Fukushima prefecture. And we proceeded to Akita, north area, and Iwate, also north area. And after that, we will go all around Japan. Uh, next, please. Uh, we are doing. Uh, the, this is me. I am encouraging people to uh, but anyway, I'm doing such a business also. Next, please. So overall picture of decarbonization is like this, I believe. Resources uh, shift from coal, uh, oil, gas to renewable energy and biomass. And transportation, offices, houses, uh, industries, others, uh, I uh, described uh, now. And even though, even it's possible, 100% may be difficult, probably difficult. So we need CCS, carbon capture and sequestering, or even uh, direct air capture and sequesterization. Uh, they, these are not clever method, but uh, it, it's because it consume energy, but it's technologically feasible. And maybe if 95% of decarbonization can be done by what I said now, then the five, remaining 5% can be uh, afforestation or CCS and even ducks. Uh, I think this is overall picture of decarbonization. Next, please. The Platinum Society needs new businesses uh, and health and self-support and tourism culture, entertainment, human development infrastructure. Today I talk primary industry, in particular forestry and renewable energy and circulation industry and separate recovery uh, and electric furnace and bioplastic uh, uh, because this is directly uh, related to decarbonization of the society. Next, please. Professor, could I perhaps ask you so, to uh, wrap up here? As I said, we have vision. It's very difficult because now our civilization is based on fossil resources, much more than 90%. And we must shift to renewable society based, including biomass. So this is huge shift. So it's not, of course, uh, easy. But the society, after we have done this, the society is much better. We can self-supply. So vision is bright, but the shift to the vision is the challenge. That is uh, my uh, conclusion. Thank you. Oh, so this is the last one. 
uh, I am I have been working in this kind of uh, things from uh, rather 1980s and so I have quite wrong and so I published quite a, a number of books uh, English and, and Japanese and English as well and this is the newest one new vision 20. 50. This is the translation of the uh, Japanese version. And uh, this is from the Springer Open. And so you can download free. Please uh, read it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Komiyama. Uh, you gave a, a very interesting overview of the Platinum Society. Also a very optimistic view, perhaps, of this endpoint, although it may be challenging also to get there. And hopefully, uh, yeah, we still have some time to discuss this later. Um, I would also like to ask uh, every participant in the meeting that if they would like to ask a question to Professor Komiyama and also the other speakers later, then they can use the Q&A function in Zoom and uh, we will be able to get to uh, the questions later. Uh, we still have uh, two speakers now, uh, from which we'll hear also their views uh, on these topics. So to start with, uh, I'd like to hand over to you, Björn, um, and um, yeah, hear about uh, your perspectives also from the, the view of the EU from uh, yeah, economic affairs. Uh, you have 15 minutes, please. Thank you very much. Um... I'm just trying to find my presentation. Well, there it is. Can you see my presentation? Uh, yes, yes, not full screen. Yes. Not full screen. Okay, wait a sec. Good. Uh, can you see it now? No. Uh, I think you're starting screen sharing now. And um, if you, yeah, now, uh, now we can see. Yes. Ah, wonderful. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, having me today. It's a pleasure to be on this panel and an honor to intervene on uh, this subject after such an eminent speaker as uh, Professor Kamiyama. Uh, I will look at uh, the things that he has described with the eyes of an engineer uh, from the perspective of an economist. Uh, and I will focus, I think, a bit more on the transition which uh, Professor Kamiyama has also described as uh, a challenge. I will start by uh, a short comparison of the Platinum Society concept and uh, the way the Green Deal and uh, the decarbonization is uh, integrated in uh, European policymaking. Then I will focus on decarbonization. Um, I will have a few words to say about saturation and some open questions for the end. So the uh, uh, picture on the left is taken from an older presentation by uh, Professor Komiyama. And it shows that the Platinum Society is not only a technical project of, uh, of decarbonization and greening, it is also a societal uh, project, which is about uh, uh, well-being beyond uh, the pure uh, accumulation of uh, material wealth. It is about participation in an aging society. Um, and this is something that is reflected in the way that uh, at the Commission we think about uh, sustainability, because uh, for us, sustainability has obviously the environmental dimension, but it also has the social dimension. And it requires a uh, sustainable economy uh, to support it. 
So, so much for a short introduction. And now let me come to the core of uh, what we are doing in, in my team. I will look at uh, the decarbonization challenge uh, with the aid of a model that uh, my colleagues have developed. That is a dynamic uh, model forward looking, uh, which at the same time has um, at least a rudimentary uh, economic structure with uh, different sectors that all can either use uh, fossil fuels or uh, clean uh, energy from renewables. Um, there is technical progress uh, incorporated into that model. Part of it is uh, exogenous, but part of it comes from the fact that uh, firms use green technology and learn how to do it better and thereby become more efficient. These are the GDP effects of uh, decarbonization that we find over the three decades up to uh, 2050. So they are negative, but they are very, very small. Uh, less than two percentage points of GDP over three decades is really not much. And there are practically no uh, employment effects in, uh, in this uh, simulation exercise. Uh, what is striking is that it is less costly to use a market-based policy that is carbon pricing or um, the uh, ETS uh, rather than regulation. And the reason is that with the ETS or with carbon pricing, you collect funds that you can then re-inject into the economy. And the most efficient way of doing that uh, in, in terms of reducing the cost of the transition is to reuse the um, tax revenue for uh, subsidizing green technology. Now, this is the picture uh, for the end point in 2050, but what happens in the meantime? Well, the structural adjustments will be very, very large. There are different uh, exercises that have been carried out by, by different uh, um, uh, researchers, they do not come to exactly the same numbers, but what is clear is that all the sectors involving fossil fuels will have to shrink uh, tremendously, while uh, clean electricity generation is set to expand, uh, and possibly uh, by a lot. Uh, in the process, uh, other uh, economic sectors than energy will also be affected, uh, but much less. Uh, so metal industry uh, and, and chemical industry, because they are very energy incentive, intensive. Um, construction, probably very much so in the transition, as there will be demand for additional uh, infrastructure for renovating housing um, and, uh, and for uh, equipment. So what happens if that uh, reallocation of labor and capital across sectors or between, um, so, or, or within sectors actually, uh, is not that smooth? Well, there are possible adjustment frictions that are discussed in the uh, literature. And we have the experience in Europe of uh, large structural change that has led to structural unemployment when uh, the um, uh, production in the, uh, in the metal industry decreased in the 80s, for instance. There can be financial frictions. Um, green technology is relatively new and the firms uh, using it tend to be smaller uh, than the ones in uh, the traditional industry. So for them, it will be harder to obtain credit uh, and that uh, can stand in the way of a smooth transition. There is the issue that uh, former investment into polluting uh, technology uh, loses value uh, in the transition. And uh, there are concerns about financial stability in that context. Other things that could uh, lead to frictions are, uh, for instance, bottlenecks. The uh, Construction sector is a case in point. Uh, already now, uh, they say uh, that they find it very hard to find uh, workers. 
and uh, the reported difficulty to find building materials is higher than it was at any time in the last uh, 30 years. And as I said, in the transition, the demand for construction uh, is set to increase. Uh, final point, there may be institutional weaknesses standing in the way. One example is the very long time it takes to obtain a permit for building a wind park. And then a few words on uh, saturation. Um, Professor Komiyama has shown us a chart that was similar to the one on the left-hand side here, where he showed the absolute decoupling of uh, greenhouse gas emissions from uh, the increasing uh, output, increasing GDP. But that same decoupling, according to the OECD, is much harder to achieve for uh, materials. Now, this is an aggregated view, and uh, Professor Komiyama has given us uh, insights at, uh, at industry level that I found uh, very interesting. But uh, uh, perhaps we can discuss how to get that industry view uh, in line with that view of the OECD that at the aggregate level, uh, materials use is not going to uh, decouple, at least not in absolute terms, from uh, increasing GDP over the coming decades. Um, that raises an issue, by the way, uh, that uh, has been discussed in economics for over four decades now, that is, uh, to what extent is infinite GDP growth possible on a planet that is, uh, in the end, finite? Um, finally, since we were talking about uh, well-being, that's a concept that is broader than uh, the accumulation of uh, material well-being. But when you look at uh, uh, multidimensional um, concepts of well-being, at one point you will be required to make value judgments. Uh, that is something that economists traditionally shy away from. And the question here is, uh, should we not uh, try to bring an ethical dimension into economic uh, reasoning when it comes to uh, moving beyond GDP. Uh, and to conclude, two open questions. One is uh, related to aging and uh, the observation that productivity growth has decreased over the past three decades. Will the green transition solve that problem? Well, looking at uh, the challenge of uh, reallocating capital and labor across sectors, that is possibly something that in the transition will reduce productivity, uh, at least uh, for some time. But then there's the other argument, the so-called Porter hypothesis, that uh, regulation uh, that uh, is aimed at achieving uh, higher energy efficiency or higher uh, ecological standards actually increases innovation across the economy. And the uh, literature tends to support uh, this idea. So overall, there could be a, a small positive impact on uh, productivity from the green transition. Will it be enough to uh, compensate the secular stagnation? That I'm not uh, sure of. And my last point is uh, related to the news that we see uh, on TV every day. Uh, decarbonization uh, requires global cooperation. Uh, a stable climate is a, is a global public good. Uh, how can we achieve that in uh, a time where competition and sometimes um, violent competition among great powers uh, has reemerged? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Bjorn. Um, that was a, was a fantastic overview of, um, yeah, actually similar concepts as what Professor Komiyama talked about, even though we may have also different names for it uh, sometimes. And yeah, I very much like um, that you ended with um, a few questions on how this green transition relates uh, to other questions in economics, the, the loss of productivity, the, might happen with the aging societies and uh, yeah, the great power competition. Uh, hopefully we can still get to that uh, later with our discussion.
Um, we then have uh, one more uh, presentation. Uh, so I'd like now I'd like to go back uh, to Anna. Um, you um, are working on the topic of uh, circular economy of uh, uh, North Vigil. Um So uh, we're very much looking forward to, uh, yeah, to hear from your perspective on uh, the green transition and, uh, uh, and aging societies. Please go ahead. Thank you. So are you seeing my screen now? Uh, yes, very well. So, well, thank you. Uh, and those have been very interesting presentations. And well, first I want to thank the organization for the possibility of being here today and be part of this discussion. So I think my role here is to be bring another perspective to the mix. And as you said, I've been working mainly on sustainability transitions within this approach of the circular economy. So that's the main issue that I'll be addressing today. And well, circular economy is usually defined by its opposition to a linear take-make disposal eco economy, what we have still today. And the aim is to propose a system that is restorative or re regenerative by intention and design. So the main focus is on closing the loop, on reducing, on sharing, on leasing, on reusing, repairing and refurbishing and recycling activities. So keeping the existing materials and products as long as possible in the economic cycle. So today, uh, what I want to uh, talk about is uh, about three main issues. First, uh, I want to talk about a little bit about what experts and people working in circular economy identify as the main barriers to this approach to, towards a sustainability transition. And I want to share some thoughts also concerning uh, the global uh, circular economy uh, picture, and possibly also um, talk about some possible implications if I have the time. So um, first, I'd like to talk about a little bit about um, a Delphi study that I did uh, in 2018. And a Delphi study is a foresight exercise, and it's used mainly to explore problems um, where there is incomplete and uncertain understanding. and the main issue is that we used the insights of people already working on the subject to get uh, more knowledge about that. Uh, and, and in this case, we gather a series of circular economy experts from academia, business and social society and ask them first, uh, what was their thoughts concerning circular economy within the sustainability debate? And also to identify the most important drivers and barriers. And I will not dive with the study itself. It's published, and if you need, uh, if you have any questions, we can. I can share the link, or you can contact me. Um, but um, what I wanted to to talk about was some of the main points that were stressed in the study, and what, one of them um, uh, is this um, uh, importance of circular economy within the sustainability transition. And circular economy has been defined uh, in, 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 in the expert's view as a more tangible and operational approach. And this is important because it echoes some perception of circular economy uh, momentum in the sustainability debate as a promising approach to improve uh, concreteness in objective setting. So if sustainability as a concept has broad objectives and top-down approaches, uh, that can limit uh, the delineation of a pathway to achieve transition, circular economy more down to word perspective was mentioned as being an advantage uh, to, to implementation and identification of uh, policy priorities. And when talking about those priorities, cons uh, well, towards circular economy, the experts stress uh, economical, financial and market factors first. Um, and this points to a critical importance of overcoming barriers related with, well, initial costs and market uncertainty. And the experts also underline um, uh, the, 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 that companies still fail to see the urgency of changing or, or better, they, they are reconfiguring their processes and business models quite slowly, preferring uh, to follow, well, the still traditional pathways um, uh, instead of innovating and trying new approaches. And this relates with, well, incumbent paradigms and lock-ins, but as well as the lack of demand. And that was another interesting finding. And it relates uh, with social and cultural factors. Um, and one of the, the main challenges that was mentioned was on how to make circular economy relevant to consumers. 
and consumer habits change very slowly and they are still limited by um, the acceptance of circular business models as for instance product as a service uh, case um, and it's really difficult to change mindsets and consumers well their awareness and interest for circular economy and circular economy goods and services is also limited by well, price considerations of course but also by the availability and trust in clear information and there were several issues uh, stressed by the experts namely labels are still not clear to the average consumer and even time can be a problem as there are significant search costs in 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 scrutinizing purchasing decisions and we also have several cases of greenwashing so that tends to limit um uh, consumer um, uh, awareness and um, uh, adherence to circular economy business uh, in products and services. And that led us to the importance of a coordination role of governments um, to ensure those framework conditions. And here the experts emphasize uh, mostly the importance of integrating the already existent uh, initiatives, uh, mostly of re regulatory um, focus on recycling, on energy efficiency and so on in career and strategic roadmaps in order to avoid uh, mismatches and contradictory incentives. And other non-regulatory incentives are related well with the provision of infrastructures, uh, human capital, and also this diffusion of circular economy related information for both enterprises and society. But all these patterns are mainly true when considering high income or developed countries, which lead, lead us to um, question some of these geographic considerations concerning circular economy definition and implementation rhythms at a, a, global, a global level. And, well, circular economy in the last decade uh, have, has become a, a hot global topic. And if you search for circular economy in one of um, in one database, in this case, we use Web of Science, we can see already a global um, picture where circular economy is being researched and it's quite global. And it, this is actually a map from, from 2018. So I would expect that this would be much more crowded uh, if updated now, but already gives us an uh, idea. Um, but well, uh, whilst there is some agreement on the goals of the circular economy, a very heterogeneous picture stands out when uh, we actually focus on its actual definition and its ambition and implementation rhythms. And uh, for instance, in Europe, we have several legislative proposals, but if we um, um, contrast um, countries, we see also a, a very different uh, picture there with Northern countries as front runners in development of integrated uh, circular economy strategies, where other types of countries still lag a little bit behind, namely uh, uh, Eastern European countries. Um, in, in North America, we have the United States, uh, where there are different understandings of circular economy, but they are mostly focused on industrial symbiosis cases or uh, renewable uh, energy actions. Uh, so, and, and uh, focus on more local level initiatives. Uh, Canada has a more um, uh, integrated governmental um, a, a, a plan and be supporting different circular economy in, initiatives, initiatives in the country. Uh, in Asia, well, uh, uh, there are several examples. I will not dwell in the Japanese one. I think we have the expert in-house, um, but I will stress the, the high ambition in the field of, of, of Japan. Uh, in China, uh, we have uh, specific uh, circular economy legislations uh, since uh, er, the early 2000s, but uh, they are mo mostly focused on eco-industrial parks and cleaner production practice. And we have different examples in uh, high developing uh, countries like India, where we have repairing and use habits very ingrained in the society, but where circular economy initiatives and initiatives are still few. Even if we have, for instance, the Ellen McCarthy Foundation estimating uh, in 2016, that the implementation of a circular economy in India would create an annual value of around $218 billion uh, in 2030. Um, if we go 
to to South America, Latin America, and the Caribbean region, we have several governments that are already in the process of, of developing uh, dedicated circular economy roadmaps and strategies, but they are still in its infancy. Uh, in in Africa, we have different uh, really interesting initiatives that are um, that are starting and that could fall under this circular economy umbrella in different countries. And of relevance is, for instance, the African Circular Economy Alliance, which is a government-led coalition of African nations um, focused on transforming the continent uh, into a more circular economy. So what we are hearing about circular economy is that is a concept diffused all uh, through the world, but it looks like uh, very different from continent to, to continent to country to country. Um, but with circular economy being identified um, in different reports as having benefits, not only for developed countries, but as well as uh, for fast developing countries like India and Brazil, and also lower income countries. So there are, uh, this, is, this table is not uh, exhaustive, but it can, can help us to uh, get an overview um, about the differences uh, between types of countries. And uh, well, it's not the case that there are not already several circular economy activities in lower income countries, but that they are mainly practiced more in an informal way, with the focus most commonly placed in the end of cycle, in waste management, management activities. And uh, some lower income countries have also specific challenging barriers related well to, to this need of a high institutional framing that circular economy um, requires. Uh, the lack of specific policies, uh, as well as limited um, supply of human capital, um, and that can also limit circular economy, economy implementation. Uh, other issues concern, for instance, the ability to enforce uh, existing regulations uh, to, due to reduced capacities of effectively monitoring lack of conformity and also uh, high levels of corruption. And there are also several questions that can be raised on how much this landscape would change, well, especially on fast developing countries. Will the increase of per capita income impact on reuse and repair activities already taking place? Will those become less attractive and uh, a use and discard attitude assume? Well, this is to say that country specificities matter. So geographic location, income level, growth rates, policy frameworks, economic governance, demand conditions, uh, those are all factors that influence circular economy ambition and actual implementation. So what are some uh, implications of what I have been talking about so far? So one of the set of implications um, that I would like to stress is this appropriation of the circular economy concept by the policy um, agenda worldwide in the last years. This is to say that this momentum can be used by nations to drive more comprehensive pro-sustainability policy definition, profiting from this circular economy characterization as a more tangible and operational concept uh, in a sustainability transition pathway. Uh, secondly, um, the adoption and acceleration of a circular economy can be facilitated by the establishment of explicit and coherent political strategies. Uh, and this relates with decision makers and public bodies coordination role and a possible generic agenda setting would st stress the need to well integrate initiatives and regulatory frameworks in a more coherent strategy to avoid mismatches and contradictory incentives and the need to address financial blockings um, and the, the need to invest in innovation and not only in, in technological intensive se sectors but also in circle business model innovation. Um, and, and this can also be related with this importance of address consumers and users awareness and engagement in circular economy. Uh, and also the importance of strengthen and streamline cooperation between actors, special uh, inter-firm relationships along the value chain and between the public and private sectors an issue also a participatory process involving all stakeholders. Um, and I would like to end with this slide. And this, this is a snapshot of the world in 2018. And it's interesting to understand how much the world uh, changed or, or not since then. 
And this links with my doubts concerning the speed of change. Um, so even if several countries are already moving into a decarbonization pathway, this is still happening at a slow play, uh, pace uh, with few systematic strategies. And well, extreme events are even worse now and climate conditions tend to hit severe implementation issues. Therefore, well, more than answers, I think I, I have lots of questions on how to overcome obstacles and mainstream, well, that platinum society that Dr. Komeyama was talking about. Uh, so my presentation uh, aimed to, to give some uh, topics uh, as food for thought. Uh, and I thank you for your attention and I finished with this. Thank you very much, Anna. So you gave a, a great overview of uh, yeah, how broad actually uh, the concept is and also that it's really yeah, discussed much more uh, than just in Europe. And I'd also like to get back to you on that, what the implications are of maybe these, these different interpretations uh, of the concept of circular economy. Um, first, however, uh, I would have another question then um, to start a debate with uh, uh, Professor Komiyama. Um, one of the things you spoke about in, uh, in your speech about the Platinum Society are the various pathways to get to a more efficient uh, industrial system, a more energy and resource efficient society. Um, but my question is about the part where that is difficult. So we might have some material production that still needs to happen in the traditional way, hopefully with less emissions, but still with blast furnaces or traditional cement production, uh, traditional glass uh, production. Uh, how can we convince uh, these companies to still invest in low carbon technology, in emissions reductions, if so much of their market might be disappearing? You are still okay. yes. Thank you. I think the uh, some uh, will go naturally. For example, the and uh, steel production by a blast furnace to uh, remove oxygen from iron ore will naturally decrease. That is actually happening in Japan. Blast furnace, number of blast furnace will decrease. That is because the some market is being replaced by scraps. Maybe China will have a very severe situation within a decade or two because the quite a bit of scraps of steel will appear in a decade or two from cars and buildings which were built uh, maybe 20 years ago will be replaced then at that time, the saturation is the reality. So with respect to metals, partly it will go naturally to circular economy. But petrochemistry is the most difficult point, I think, and cement production. I didn't mention about cement production. But the um, marble is calcium uh, C C A C O three marble. Cement production is to remove C O two to make C A O. That is cement production. But the marble is stable. Many buildings are. <laughs> made of marble. And so finally, we can uh, 
make cement absorb CO2 from atmosphere. That kind of uh, studies uh, being uh, made uh, nowadays very rapidly. And so some transition is uh, difficult. We need some uh, strong uh, motivation or a strong drive. But some part will naturally uh, go. What we need is how to fasten, how to uh, make in hurry uh, that transition. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Maybe, yeah, if we think about such uh, faster um, phase out of this production, we should also yeah, keep an eye on the things that Bjorn mentioned. Because we, might... you, can, you can consider at 2050, we have many scraps, scraps of metals. That is equal to the amount we need to build new things. That is saturation. Then we have two ways. One is throw away scraps into ocean or desert. And we dig out iron ore. Otherwise, we need to melt scraps, which should we take? That is the only the question. I believe human beings will choose to use scraps in circular economy. Thank you. Um, yes, indeed, if we have yeah, such secondary resources available, it would be a waste not to use them. Uh, I'd now like to yeah, ask a question to, to um, you were also talking about um, yeah, some, the, the concept of the Green Deal, which is, of course, very important in the EU and emphasizing that it is about more uh, than just the climate and energy angle, but it also has a, a social and in the last weeks, especially also a geopolitical uh, dimension. Uh, my question is about the trade-offs uh, between those uh, they can exist even within a limited domain perhaps of the circular economy if we talk about emissions reductions versus uh, resource use um, but especially if we also then consider the, the social dimension of the transition and the geopolitics uh, in your work how do you balance these different uh, policy concerns thank you very much that, that's a difficult one uh, of course or a, a challenging one say um, I've, I've tried with the um, focus on the on the transition and uh, on the uh, sectoral impact of it to highlight some of the um, tension points that uh, that there exist between the uh, greening of the economy and uh, and the the social aspects of it. Um, in very general terms, I think it is a, a question that is uh, one of policy design. Uh, for instance, I have shown that uh, you can use the uh, revenue from a carbon tax to um, give handouts to, uh, to workers um, who are most affected by that uh, tax or to use it for retraining people um, to uh, become, um, to, to accumulate the skills that are required in a greener job. Uh, or you can, um, which was the way that I, that I favored, use it to uh, subsidize uh, green technologies. Now, these are, these are different, uh, and difficult points for for policymakers, but of course, these uh, tension points that uh, that you mentioned uh, they do exist. And another one is that uh, the transition will require us to mobilize uh, very large amounts of uh, of material, uh, which 
at the same time uh, emit uh, greenhouse gases when they are produced. And uh, the um, example just given by Professor Komiyama of cement is, uh, is a very uh, pertinent one, uh, as we don't know yet uh, how, well, we don't know well yet how to decarbonize the, uh, the production of cement, and we don't know yet very well how to uh, reuse uh, concrete once we tear down a, a building. So there are technological challenges, there are social challenges, um, but uh, intelligent policy design should be able to smoothen some of the, the edges that we face. And then in the end, uh, politics is about uh, making difficult choices. And uh, we are faced with a uh, enormous challenge that is climate change. We are uh, faced with another enormous challenge that is biodiversity loss. Uh, we need to uh, allow um, the economies in, in emerging countries uh, to grow. Uh, and somehow we, we need to reconcile uh, all of that. Um, and there again, Professor Komiyama showed an interesting way uh, that is uh, and uh, and Anna had that as well, uh, using using shortcuts. So not uh, locking uh, emerging economies into the same production structures that we have in advanced economies, but going directly to the to the next step um, and uh, and uh, avoid some of the sunk costs. Sorry that I'm so so general and uh, and relatively unspecific, but it is a it is a difficult question you have thrown at me. Oh, thank you for the answer, and of course, yeah, the the importance of yeah, politicians actually making the choices there. It's very relevant. Um, Anna, uh, you uh, yeah brought uh, up a lot of different uh, ways in which you can look at circularity, and also that this is uh, being looked at differently uh, in different parts of the world. Um, my question is also, uh, do you think there's enough recognition of that, of people, of industries who, who need to implement more circular economy business models? Or do you think there's a risk that yeah, uh, policymakers and industries can also talk past each other if they mean different things with circular economy? Well, uh, I would say that, that, that there is a risk, of course. Um, but um, this is a global discussion, actually. And I think what I, what I tried to, to aim for with my presentation was to um, identify the, 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 the different parts that, are already, uh, that already exist and that can be um, taken. We don't have to have only one path. And, and, and this links, for instance, with different discussions on transition to sustainability. Is circular economy better than the growth pathways and so on? And I think we are discussing false dictonomies here. Um, and that's not helpful in the overall uh, objectives of, of sustainability transition. Um, I think um, Several understandings of several pathways to towards sustainability uh, um, are, are are put forward and can be made um, concrete uh, within the specificities of each country of each continent. Uh, even if we have also to agree uh, that um, there are specific uh, implementation challenges that have to be taken in consideration. But overall, I think, well, ambitions have been increasing in each COP meeting, for instance. Um, but, but that, that, uh, that, that uh, impact directly on the implementation side. Um, and, and that runs into different limitations and path dependencies in each different country. And here I would like to, to put forward another concept that it's the one of climate diplomacy and it, it calls for this um, uh, global strategy um, to address these uh, wicked problems all over the globe. 
And I think it was something that also Bjorn uh, mentioned um, um, quickly in, in his presentation. And I think it's important to understand how this uh, um, can be made uh, possible in our um, nowadays world where we have um, so much more competition and this wild uh, card trends that keep uh, appearing as the pandemic, uh, as the defense crisis uh, of today. So uh, mixed feelings about that. And I think, again, your question is a, quite a tricky one because it, it, you, I don't have a straight answer at this point. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. Um, so we, uh, we still have about eight minutes uh, left. Um, I would like to maybe ask Professor Kumiyama uh, one final question then. And it relates perhaps a little bit to something Bjorn also mentioned. Uh, and that is that some countries, uh, it would be good if they could uh, make a jump to, uh, to advance more quickly to where a lot of advanced economies already are or are on their way to towards this platinum society. Uh, but what about uh, developing economies and emerging economies if there still is a lot of growth to come, especially getting people into the middle classes and a lot of yeah, material wealth that is far lower than we are used to in the EU and, uh, and in Japan? Um, how can these countries uh, achieve these goals uh, while still um, yeah, combining uh, yeah, the sustainability objectives with uh, growing their incomes? Oh, I will add one point. Uh, of course, the sustainability and well-being of people must be combined. And uh, as uh, Anna said, the, uh, the way to the vision depends on country by country. And I don't think developing countries are disadvantageous than developed countries because developed countries has existing structure, very heavy. For example, we have many coal burning power plants in Japan, but in India and other countries, other developing countries, they directly go to the vision because there is no existing structure. In that sense, one way is we do experiments, we do actions in developing countries first, and then we can uh, reversely import that. Such kind of project, uh, process may be possible. Uh, in this uh, big uh, transition uh, period of the human beings. Not only develop, developed countries go first, then developing country follows. I don't think that is not, if they have sufficient capitals, they can do better. Developing countries can do better than Japan, I think. How do you think, Anna? Oh, Anna, uh, direct question to you. Yeah, well, I was thinking about that. And it depends also, uh, because there are a lot of uh, um, possible advantages, again, uh, to avoid this li linear lock-in that we are talking about that developed uh, countries have. They have the infrastructures in, in place, they have PAT dependencies, and that can limit the speed of change. And in, in um, um, lower income countries, that, uh, that doesn't exist. But we have a, another set of barriers that are quite concerning. 
um, and those are related with the political system, with transparency issues, with uh, corruption, um, and those are more difficult to overcome, um, and they are structural uh, barriers. So I think um, it, it will depend on each country pathway, um, and, and uh, even in uh, in, in fast developing high growth countries where we already have this data, for instance, India, I mentioned before, where we have a specific study that said something like, if we reconfigure the society, we would have um, a, a, a big economic um, um, impact um, uh, and a health impact, um, they are still lagging behind. So I think it's, it's uh, a really um, country by country uh, uh, um, discussion, and it's not an easy one to overcome. I think w when I was reading the, 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 the concept of uh, this platinum society, I was uh, thinking about um, on how to make that um, possible worldwide with all these different uh, challenges and barriers. So would it be possible to really uh, uh, emulate what we were thinking about uh, in 2015 all over the country, all over the world? I, I, I think maybe I'm the cynic here and I would like to be more positive, but even with technological ev evolution, I'm not sure if that will be possible at a global scale. And I, 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 I bring the question back to you, Dr. Komeyama. So uh, a final word, maybe in one minute from you, Professor, and then uh, I will conclude. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> yeah, and the one point, another point is the uh, the human beings uh, accumulated uh, much uh, capital. Developed countries have uh, looking for uh, targets to uh, deposit the capital. And so many chances, so many opportunities in developing countries. We need some good uh, market mechanism to realize it. I don't know if this is the answer or not. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor. So uh, we have heard um, you know, from all of you also a few hopeful messages, even though uh, the challenges um, which we were talking about are some of the largest uh, the world faces. but. There is a prospect both in yeah, the developed world for a, a much more uh, efficient uh, society, more energy and resource efficient, and that will bring other benefits as well. But if we start looking at specific sectors, specific countries, then maybe there yeah, are some very local circumstances that are uh, specific um, to these uh, yeah, industries and regions. Uh, that will be taken uh, or need to be taken into account when we think about uh, these transitions. Um, so with that, I'd like to yeah, thank uh, all the speakers very much uh, for their in-depth presentations and also for following up with some conversation among each other, especially a great thanks to Professor Komiyama and also to uh, our uh, two uh, interventions by Björn and by Anna. Thank you very much. And uh, as a final word, I'd like to say that those um, who are interested in well, a concept Anna also quickly mentioned, climate diplomacy. Uh, we have a meeting this afternoon at two o'clock European time on the concept of climate clubs and the role carbon pricing plays there. So if you feel like um, yeah, more climate change discussions, you are very welcome to join there as well. Um, thank you very much uh, to everyone again for joining and I wish you all a great day and those in, uh, uh, in Japan uh, a great afternoon and evening. 
Thank you. Thank you for having us.